Good evening and welcome to this evening's Rosenbach virtual behind the bookcase presentation, the industry and artistry of bookmaking. My name is Andrew White and I am the volunteer coordinator here at the Rosenbach. The books we'll be looking at tonight are drawn from the collection of the Rosenbach. For those of you who haven't been to the Rosenbach before, I wanted to give you an overview of who we are and what we have just to get us started. Our founders, Philip and Abraham Rosenbach, lived in this house, which is now home to our museum and library. We're known for our collection of primarily American and British books and manuscripts. We're currently open for in-person visits, so if you'd like to visit, you can make an appointment on our website. All of our programs are still virtual, so if you're not ready to venture out, you can still meet us virtually. I'll tell you more about upcoming programs later in the presentation. I'd like to take a moment to invite you to support the Rosenbach by making a donation if you're able, so we can continue to offer free programming like this. Emily Parker, the Rosenbach's Director of Education, will be managing the chat today, as well as sharing links. For those of you who'd like an interactive experience, please feel free to ask questions in the chat. I'll also be inviting feedback at points during the presentation, so feel free to respond. But if you'd rather just sit back, relax, and let the presentation pour over you, that's fine too. When we think about books, we focus more oftentimes on content than on structure. But the structure of some books is so incredible that they should be considered works of art. Abraham Rosenbach, one of our founders, was obsessed with ferreting out books like these. Today, we'll be thinking about books more as art objects, focusing more on structure and less on the author and the contents. We'll start by looking at some medieval manuscripts and end with something from the late 19th century. We'll see two different examples of medieval manuscripts, and interestingly enough, neither of them are religious. Secular literature was more common than you'd think during the Middle Ages. There were several types of secular literature that were popular during this time, including books about courtly love, epic poems like Beowulf, and pilgrimage stories like the Canterbury Tales. But regardless of whether they were secular or religious, people in the Middle Ages loved decorated books. So, you needed more than a scribe and a bookbinder. You needed an illuminator, a rubricator, a parchment maker, and the list goes on. I'll share more about the materials and the process when we look at some examples. This is just a fragment of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. But what a fragment it is! Originally, the pages would have been bound into a book. If you've read the Canterbury Tales, write in the chat what you remember about the stories. Canterbury Tales describes the journeys of religious pilgrims traveling to St. Thomas Becket's Shrine in Canterbury. There are 24 tales in total. Chaucer never completed the Canterbury Tales and never noted an overall order for the tales. As you may remember, it's written in medieval English, which was pretty revolutionary because most books at that time were written in Latin. This is the end of the Reeves tale. A Reeve is an estate agent. And the beginning of the Cook's prologue. The pages are parchment or animal skin which is typical for medieval European books. The I'm text sure. is- I'm just, I'm gonna interrupt you for a second. Um, Super. Because there's a couple couple answers coming into the chat about what people remember about the Canterbury Tales. So, okay. um, let's see. Um, so someone says, I remember a lot of shenanigans between characters as well as some moral lessons. Um, somebody else remembers the travel and Danielle says uh, she remembers the, uh, the tales were actually pretty bawdy. Yes, yes, pretty appallingly bawdy in places, <laughs> and at other times really tragic and grand. It's amazing the whole panoply of literary devices and uh, themes that Chaucer gets in the Canterbury Tales, which is why probably why we're still reading it today. So thank you for those for those comments. Thank you. If you take a look at this image, you can see that the manuscript has been cropped. We know that these pages were rebound two or three times before the manuscript was taken apart. The image would have been cropped around the time when it was rebound. 
spots of animal hair are on the corner of the page where there seems to be a stain on the manuscript you can see there. You can see the lines made by the rubricator to help keep the words straight and the margins even. So we've just looked at a pilgrimage tale. Now it's on to another medieval genre, a story about courtly love. This is the Confessio Amantis, or the Lover's Confession, by Chaucer's friend, John Gower. This is a 33,000 line tale, also written in Middle English, which we think Chaucer convinced Gower to do. In the story, a lovesick man wanders through a forest. He calls for Venus, who appears and asks to know why he's upset. He says he's on the verge of dying from love. Venus thinks he should be absolved and summons her chaplain to hear his confession. Most of the book is devoted to the lover's confession, which follows the Christian pattern of the seven deadly sins. The book is bound in French Moroccan leather, which is very high quality. Originally, this type of leather was made in Morocco from goatskin, but as it became more popular, they started making it in France using sheepskin and calling it French Moroccan leather. Look at these gilded edges. The book is divided into a prologue and eight books, and you can see which section you are reading based on the page heading. In the illumination, in the illuminated initial, you can see in the center of your screen, you'll see the lover, the main character. This gold leaf illumination would have been applied only after the scribe had finished with the text. The illuminator sketches the design, then places a base coat of gesso or gum, then the gold leaf is pressed and the excess is brushed away. The rubrication or red lettering here is Latin, and we're not exactly sure why. What do you see that's similar about the Gower and the Chaucer manuscripts, and what's different? You can write your thoughts in the chat. So moving on to a religious genre, but we'll keep an eye on the chat for your responses. Uh, Book yeah, of Hours. Andrew, we got we got a response um, pretty much immediately um, that both um, maybe we could go back to that page. Um, so that both use red, yellow, blue, and green, so same colors. Um, and Lindsay says that the floral inspired border around the edges is similar. Um, and then Terry also says similar similar colors as well. Yeah, they're truly beautiful examples. Thank you for those. Thank you for those insights. So moving on to the book of hours. Um, this is the most commonly produced type of manuscript during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. It indicates the prayers and devotions that are appropriate for specific times of day and seasons of the year. These include excerpts from gospels, a calendar of church feasts, etc. You would work as the consumer, you would work with your book producer to personalize your book of hours to suit your taste and specific religious practices. A book of hours was a luxury item. It's meant to be portable and kept with you at all times. They were especially popular with women. This book of hours from 1510 is pretty amazing because it's got its original cover made from wooden boards and blue silk. Can anybody tell me what language that lettering on the spine is in? Let us know in the chat. Oh, and it looks like Shelley picked it up right away um, and says Hebrew. Yep, that is Hebrew. So the spine of this Christian book of ours is strengthened with fragments of a Hebrew manuscript, which would have been excess paper found in the shop where this was made. The owner of this book of hours spared no expense. There are a total of 20 large and 13 small illuminations. The way Mary is shown here praying with a book open before her is a standard way of depicting her. This drives home the point that praying with the help of books was an important component to Christianity. Mary is painted in ultramarine, a pigment made from the stone lapis lazuli, which could only be found in Afghanistan. Because this is such a precious pigment, Mary is often painted in blue during this time. Let's compare this book of ours to the Canterbury Tales. Which do you think was more expensive and why? Let us know in the chat.
my gosh, we've got a sharp group of people tonight. Um, so the chat messages are rolling in. Um, so um, Anne says uh, that the book, the blue pigment uh, is similar. Um, the book of hours, uh, again, because of the, the, a lot of the blue, um, LOL. Um, and Shelly says the book of hours, all of the additional coloration um, is a little bit different. Um, and then Karen says the same thing, that the book of hours is, is a fully colored illustration. Tanya points out that, um, and Tanya, if I, if I get this wrong, definitely uh, correct me, um, but is saying that the Book of Hours seems more personalized than the, um, than the Canterbury Tales. Um, and then Mary says the Book of Hours um, due to the, the amount of color, um, especially the blue. And oh, thanks everybody. I did oh, sorry, Emily. Correctly, so. Most of the books that Dr. Rosenbach collected were after Gutenberg and after removable types. So it's, I can't tell you how fascinating it is to look at, to get to look at these manuscripts. This is really fun. That book of ours is so beautiful. And then so. Kay actually um, says that, um, and this is an interesting comment, the, uh, the composition is really different and more complex as well with the with the image yeah well actually point. with the, just the whole page much right. more complex yeah and i love this mysterious little beast this little like dragon griffin creature down at the bottom of the book of hours it's always fun to see the little medieval bestiary creatures in the in the illuminated manuscripts so thanks everybody so moving on this book is Marcus Tellus Cicero's orations printed in 1471. The orations are speeches given in 63 BCE by Cicero, the Council of Rome, to the Roman Senate to expose a plot to overthrow the Roman government by Catiline and his allies. This is our first example of printed rather than written words. You can see how it's different from the Book of Hours. Movable type was developed by Gutenberg in 1440, but didn't reach Venice, where this was printed, until 1469. This book, the Cicero, was created in 1471, so we're still within the early years of printing in Italy. In the first 20 years of printing in Italy, Italian printers did not print the images. They were still illuminated by hand. Eventually, woodcut illustrations became the norm. But in the early years, hand-painted illustration was still favored. Why do you think that was? You can let us know in the chat. By the way, there's no right answer here. And I'm also going to say, if, if it is an option for you, sometimes we forget to check this box, but if it is an option for you, um, change your two setting to all panelists and attendees, and that way everybody can see it. Um, it's not the it's not the default setting. The default setting is just all panelists. But again, sometimes we forget to change that setting, so you might not be able to do it. But if you can, everybody can see your chat, so that'd be great. So Mary says um, that she thinks that the painting might have been um, painting may have been used instead of um, printing the image uh, because it was more of a status symbol. Um, there's also a comment about how not everyone could access the machinery. Um, the paintings give it more value, um, more individuality. Shelley says um, that there possibly could be limited colors of printing ink. Um, and then Tanya agrees with Lindsay. Um, I'm glad we have some agreement in the chat. It's awesome. Right. Great insights, everybody. Um, we're not really sure why, like I said, uh, maybe that it's a transitional period where people still prize hand painted illustrations. Um, I like the suggestion that maybe it was, um, it was sort of for show. Um, all great points, yeah. This book is printed in Roman type. 
Uh, Roman was one of the three major typefaces in the history of Western typography. The others were Italic and Gothic. Of the three, Roman has been the most popular. In the early years of printing, letter cutters tried to make their letter forms as much as possible like the handwriting in manuscripts. But the Gothic style, as you can imagine, was difficult to cut. Instead, they used another type of script found on manuscripts, which was more simple and unembellished. Roman quickly became the most widely used typeface and is now considered the standard typeface for book typography. So moving ahead a few hundred years, this is an 1817 edition of Paradise Regained by John Milton, which was first published in 1671. This cover is made from Russian leather, which is virtually impossible to get anymore. Look at the stamped diamonds um, and the gold patterns on the edge of the cover and on the spine. The most amazing thing about this book, though, isn't the cover. It's what's called the foredge, where an artist has painted images. This photo shows the clamp that foredge painters use. Emily can also share a video of a foredge painter at work in the chat. This book also includes an example of a woodcut illustration, which eventually almost completely replaced painted illuminations. Woodblock prints like this were a popular way of illustrating books printed with movable type because woodblocks could be painted alongside the type, which you can picture in the flatbed press and printed at the same time. So to our final Andrew, book. Andrew, before we, um, before we go to the next one, um, we have some reactions in the chat about the four edge painting, uh, not surprisingly. Um, there's just some comments about how cool it is. Um, and then we have a question from Tanya about what is Ru Russian leather made of and what makes it so rare? Well, Emily, can you speak to the uh, question about Russian leather? I cannot. <laughs> it's a good question, um, but I actually don't know. Let me see while we go on to the next one. Let me see if I can find anything out about it. Um, I'm guessing that probably the uh, the skin um, that was used for the leather is probably something that's not available anymore. Um, but that's just a guess. I'm gonna I'm gonna look that up and see if I can get an answer for you, Tanya. I'm fascinated by this four edge painting. I'm glad we've gone back to this a little bit to look at it again because I don't think it has anything to do with the book, which is really fun that you would want to have this amazing artisanship on your book that isn't actually relating to Paradise Regained at all. But it is beautiful and it's fun that it's kind of a secret. You kind of have to know that it's there, flip open the book a little bit in order to see it, otherwise it's invisible, which is completely fascinating. Um, but every book should have four edge paintings, in my opinion. So moving back and moving onward to William Morris, my personal favorite, this book is The Well at the World's End, uh, printed by William Morris, 1896. Uh, Morris was, it's almost easier to say what he wasn't than to say what he was. He was a British novelist, a poet, a translator, a designer, and a socialist activist. He was part of the arts and crafts movement, which felt that the style and the artisanship uh, took a turn for the worse during the Industrial Revolution when things could be mass produced. Morris responded by creating a design company dedicated to recapturing medieval artisanship. Mars and Company still exist today, making beautiful wallpaper and fabrics for furniture. In addition to decorative arts, Morris also designed books, and this was kind of his final big spectacular project of his life um, in the years leading up to his death. Um, he founded the Kelmscott Press for William Mars. The books of his time were a symptom of the shortcomings of modern society. He thought they were ugly, they were badly made, and mass-produced. Kelmscott Press was influenced by medieval illuminated manuscripts. Uh, Morris, with Kelmscott Press, designed and printed over 50 books. He designed his own typefaces, made his own paper, and printed these by hand. He even wrote the text for some, including this one. The Well at the World's End centers around Ralph 
who was the son of the king of Upmedes, who's ordered by his father to stay home while his three brothers get to head out and explore the world. But because this is a story, Ralph disobeys his father and goes out adventuring. He kills two men whom he finds have imprisoned a woman who turns out to be the Lady of Abundance, and she and Ralph become lovers. The book's artwork is made by the great Pre-Raphaelite artist Edward Byrne Jones, who is a close friend of Morris's and a partner in Morris and Company. They made a beautiful thing, stained glass windows, amazing stuff together. Byrne Jones was also interested in medieval legends. This book sets out to mimic the medieval style. Um, and my, I'm curious, as you look at it, after having just looked at these both secular and religious medieval books, what about it looks medieval to you? Maybe what about it doesn't look so medieval? So put your thoughts into the chat. And as everybody's thinking about that, I will just get back to you about Russian leather. I have no good answer for you, unfortunately, because Russian leather seems to, when I Googled it, seems to be a cologne. Um, and that's all that came up. Um, oh, and it looks like actually somebody um, came up with something in the chat and found an interesting link. Um, so that's in the chat if you want to see it. I also am going to ask our librarian, Elizabeth Fuller, um, because I think that she'll have a better better answer. Um, and we have all of your contact information so we can follow up tonight with an answer for that. So Shelly says um, that the, the, floral, um, the floral designs um, that she sees in, in, the, um, in this one are reminiscent of those, of those medieval manuscripts. Roz points out um, that when she Googled it, she saw the cologne also. And yes, it, it does seem like it would be kind of an old spice sort of fragrance. And Mary notices that what's similar are those enlarged initial letters as well as the really fantastic border. And then um, notes that it feels really Celtic as well. Right. I'm fascinated when I look at it, having just looked at the medieval manuscripts, how similar and also both how different it is. And it looks like we have another comment coming in about Russian leather. Yeah, and that um, from Karen, I'm not gonna read through it, um, but it looks like a pretty comprehensive definition of Russian leather, which is great. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. And then Danielle says, um, notices that the stylized human figures are in this one are actually different from the medieval. Yeah. A little bit more modern looking. And then KM um, agrees um, with Danielle on that. And then Karen says, it's just from Wikipedia. Well, thank you for admitting that, but thank you, Karen. That was really good. Yeah, thanks, Karen. Yeah, it's interesting how distinct Morris's style is from the medieval that was his inspiration. Oh, and then um, someone just pointed out that Karen's comment was only sent to the panelists. So let me copy and paste that so that you all can see it because it's just really good. Thank you again, Karen, for doing that for going beyond the cologne and finding the real answer. So let's look at these two uh, side by side. Morris's um, inspired work, inspired by the medieval manuscript um, and also the actual medieval manuscript. So comparing Well at the World's End to the Canterbury Tales manuscript, I'm curious if you think Morris did a good job replicating the medieval book style um, his book is all woodblock printing in terms of the illustrations. It has no hand-painted illuminations. So I'm curious why you think that might have been. Um, so let us know what you think in the chat.
Yeah, I agree. They're both so KM rights. Uh, can't compare. They're both neat in their own ways. I agree. They're both terrific in their own ways. Yeah, me too. I think they are hard to compare. Ease of reproduction, Donna writes. And I'm not sure what Lynn's, if Lynn's question is about the medieval manuscripts or both of them, both the um, more modern ones and the medieval, but Lynn, I definitely know that with the medieval manuscripts, um, they did color them in like coloring books. They would have done the kind of, um, um, you know, creating kind of the, um, the, yeah, basically like the coloring book um, with the, um, with kind of a lighter colored pen um, and then filled and filled in the colors just because the colors were so expensive. Um, that they would have had to been, be extremely careful with that. But yeah, I'm not actually sure with the, um, with uh, William Morris, um, you know, there certainly aren't as many colors with his, but, but how, his, um, how his approach differed. So we've got a comment that Morris does a good job with accessibility. Um, but that the Canterbury Tales seem more lyrical with the writing. So the feel of the story could feel differently. Yeah, I agree that medieval manuscript, just the writing alone has an incredibly lyrical quality. Yeah, no pun intended, but it's certainly illuminating to look at the Morris and the medieval manuscripts side by side. Andrew, do you want to say a little bit more about um, the, the other book, Morris books in our collection? We have an incredible set of uh, the entire uh, Kelmscott, um, everything that Kelmscott ever printed uh, in the collection, which is kind of miraculous. Um, including things like brochures and broadsides that were printed by Morris and company by Kelmscott. Uh, the jewel in the crown of our Kelmscott collection is probably the Kelmscott Chaucer, uh, which we could do a program on that book alone. It has illustrations by the very, very close, we talked before about Edward Byrne Jones, who was a very close collaborator with William Morris and just the illustrations are astonishing. That book, I have to say, you're going to think I'm exaggerating. The book is like a world into itself because you look in every single illustration and each one has a foreground, um, a middle ground, and then a deep, deep, deep background. So as I look at it, I can always imagine like worlds within worlds. It's such an extraordinary book. It's enormous. Uh, the one thing that's kind of funny, I don't think of William Morris and Byrne Jones as typical Victorians, but the body, sexy, uh, ribald quality in some of the Canterbury Tales doesn't really come across so far as I can see in the uh, Kelmscott Canterbury Tales. The grandeur and the, the tragic grandeur of elements of the Knight's Tale really comes across magnificently but some of the racier tales and some of the really uh, scatological tales, eh, you don't really get that feel of it, but it's a fun book. And one day I'd love to do a program like this, where we just look at the Kelmscott Chaucer. It's so magnificent. Oh, and it looks like Roz has shared an article with us. Thank you, Roz. So we shall see, something to look forward to. But like I said, I would love to do that. Uh, huge fan here of William Morris and Edward Byrne Jones. 
So that brings us to the end of our presentation. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight and thank you for your um, energetic responses in the chat. It was really fun engaging in a dialogue with you around these beautiful, magnificent books and looking at the history of book production um, in the West. We have some really fun programs looking uh, coming up and Emily will put the links to those in the chat. Uh, we'll stick around a little bit and um, continue to read the chat and see what you have to say. But I'm just so grateful that you came and joined us. Um, and please come to visit us at the Rosenbach. Take a tour of the Rosenbach Brothers' home. See some of their treasures up close. See our wonderful current exhibit, the Manjuro exhibit, about a 14-year-old uh, young Japanese fisherman who was blown off course and became in 1841 the first Japanese person to visit the United States. You can also see our garden, which is open again after 10 years. I think it's 10 years, might be more than that. Um, and Andrew, I'm just gonna um, interrupt you um, to say that, um, that Roz actually shared that article accidentally with just us. So I'm gonna post that. Um, in the chat for everybody to see. It's an article about white space and the importance of white space. And she was noting that there isn't a whole lot of white space in the Canterbury Tales um, or the Morris um, well at the world's end, but she loves it anyway. Um, and then, yeah, I think the garden actually has been closed for a, closer to 20 years. Yeah, I was afraid to say it. Yeah, I think it is yeah. 20 years, yeah. <laughs> Um, it looks like there was a question, will we post this video on our website? Yes, we post our videos on the website and also on our Facebook. So thanks so much. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, and hopefully we'll see you with the next one of these.